um, my last project, um, in which I was mainly looking at 600 medical journals which were created by naval surgeons who were responsible for British and Irish emigrants and convicts, the health of British and Irish emigrants and convicts, um, in the first half of the 19th century who went to Australia, the Australian colonies. And um, in the work, I, as it developed, I was particularly trying to grapple with three kind of historiographical themes that I thought it resonated with very strongly. One of them is environment and health. There is, of course, a massive literature on environment and particularly colonial health and the effects of environment on understandings of health on land, but it seemed to me that maritime historians had really not quite got to grips with this literature. Um, there's also a literature and a developing interest in medical experimentation and the history of medical experimentation uh, and the susceptibility of particular groups to being experimented on or included in medical trials. And then also the um, historiography of particularly Australian colonial history and the kinds of people who went to Australia um, and the kind of nation that they created when they got there um, and all the problems of it. So the paper today then, there's two aims really. I want to talk about this research into vaccination um, against smallpox, the British and Irish emigrants and convicts, which started on voyages to Canada um, in the 1820s and then voyages to Australia for the rest of the first half of the 19th century. And this is an era, particularly in vaccination practice, which historians have struggled to find evidence for, this first half of the 19th century. Um, so I think it's a, quite a rich period in general. And secondly, I want to answer the so what question to this um, particular like, period of time, this little bunch of evidence, to say that actually the knowledge, is, the knowledge that we now have through this kind of stuff, of, through these surgeons' journals of these practices at sea, is actually very understand, uh, significant for our understanding of the global spread of vaccine as a method in the first half of the 19th century, but particularly for its impact on colonial and particularly Australian history. So the practice of vaccination and smallpox vaccination used the lymph of cowpox, um, also known as vaccinia, to provide pr to protection against the more serious disease of smallpox. After Edward Jenner first reported his findings on cowpox in 1798, the medical profession rapidly adopted the practice and soon came to see the alternative practice of inoculation, which is a direct transfer of smallpox matter between bodies, also known as variolation, as outmoded and increasingly as dangerous. Now, the subsequent career of Jenner's vaccine, lymph, like the disease it prevented, is closely tied to that of 19th century tra imperial travel and communications, and Alison, in particular, has described vaccine matter as a kind of colonial contagion. So from the earliest British voyages to Australia, then, smallpox and attempts to prevent it were part of the story of Australian colonisation. In 1787, the surgeons of the First Fleet had taken live smallpox matter to Botany Bay in glass vials. Jenner's vaccine also travelled around the globe from the turn of the 19th century, and it too soon arrived in Australia. In 1803, Governor Gidley King requested a supply of the new vaccine matter, and the following year, the Coromandel delivered a supply from the Royal Genarian um, Society in London. By 1806, we know that more than 1,000 people had been vaccinated with cowpox in New South Wales and the new colony of Van Diemen's Land. So these early attempts to take vaccine to Australia were part of the emergence of a global vaccine network at this point. Vaccine travelled in live cows, in drops of pus, trapped between um, pieces of glass, and in the bodies of children. In 1802, for example, vaccine arrived in Bombay, transported via a relay of children, arm to arm, across land from Baghdad. The British weren't alone in these global endeavours. The Portuguese and the French were also transporting vaccine through the Indian Ocean. And in 1803, the Spanish Crown sponsored a Royal Maritime Vaccine ex Expedition by which Jenner's vaccine travelled to Puerto Rico, Guatemala and then on to the Philippines. From 1808 then, supported by voluntary contributions, the National Vaccine Est Establishment in London distributed lymph to what they called shipping the colonies and every quarter of the habitable globe. So requiring little formal medical expertise to administer, vials and bottles of vaccine travelled with missionaries, surgeons, traders and colonial officials in the first half of the 19th century. But from about 1806, we tended, we've tended to lose the thread of how actually this vaccine travelled. From Jenner's triumph, the existing literature tends to jump to the period after 1850, when smallpox vaccination was legally enshrined in a series of national and imperial vaccination acts and increasingly opposed by organised campaigns. 
So I was interested then in how did practices of vaccination actually travel in the first decades of the 19th century? Now, Michael Bennett has recently suggested that evidence relating to the practice of vaccination in Australia, particularly in the second, third and fourth decades of the 19th century, is very limited. And specifically, he says, that there is no evidence that the British government serially inoculated convicts in order to get vaccine matter to Australia. Now, I hope that this paper shows that he is actually wrong about that. Um, (laughs) I'm not, I don't, you know, fair enough, he hadn't found the evidence, but the, the evidence is there. So this paper demonstrates to the contrary, then, that there is a great deal of evidence about serial inoculation and vaccination on voyages to Australia. Moreover, far from being an easy story of the global vaccine triumph, vaccination practices routinely failed through decay over time, environmental and climatic exposure, and the resistance of emigrants and convicts to the practices of vaccination. Most importantly, I think, what this evidence reveals is that naval surgeons, in fact, treated emigrants and convicts very differently, revealing something, I think, about the medical relationship between surgeons and different types of colonists um, and their ideas about colonialism in the 19th century. So British naval surgeons, then, were some of the earliest and most enthusiastic subscribers to the establishment as the London Genarian Society became to be known. Records of vaccination on convict ships date from some of the very first official journals in 1818. From 1821, it's certain that the commissioners of the Navy in London routinely gave packages of vaccine virus to the surgeons who superintended ships to New South Wales. By 1830, um, the Genarian Society records that the Navy was contributing £1,000 a year as an annual payment to the Institute for supplies to His Majesty's forces in the Navy and settlements abroad. Now, in 1825, um, the British government sent nine emigrant ships with 2,024 emigrants, what are called uh, known as the, a group of people known as Peter, the Peter Robinson settlers, mostly from the Blackwater River Valley in Munster in Ireland, from Cork, and they sailed from Cork and went to Upper Canada, to the north of Lake Ontario. And this was one of the earliest experiments with British government-assisted emigration. And it's just occurred to me, actually, the fact that these were Irish emigrants, I think, is very important in this kind of thinking about experimentation and British Empire and stuff like that. Now, the surgeon's journals from these ships discuss in detail the methods for vaccination and reveal that surgeons were juggling two very different objectives when they vaccinated at sea. So on the Albion, for example, the surgeon, John Thompson, vaccinated three children on the 6th of May while the ship was still in Cork Harbour. All of the vaccinations failed. Now, the surgeon, in fact, carried two different vaccines from different suppliers, Eight days later, he picked out one of these same three children and revaccinated her again twice. This was a seven-year-old girl named Catherine, and he vaccinated her in the right arm with the vaccine matter he'd got from the Navy and in the left arm with the matter he'd received um, from Dr. Johnston of Bar Street. And I'm not even sure whether this is Bar Street in London or in Cork or it might even be in Glasgow or Birmingham. So while the Navy vaccine failed, Dr. Johnston's vaccine, the second vaccine, produced what the surgeon described as a very fine pock. The surgeon noted that while the Navy had only wrapped their vaccine in paper, Dr. Johnston had used foil. So now confident of his success three times after vaccinating Catherine three times, the surgeon revaccinated Catherine's two younger siblings with Dr. Johnston's vaccine, as well as three other children. On 23rd of May, another nine days later, the surgeon chose the boy whose arm had produced the best results from which to vaccinate another seven children. He repeated the twice more, each the process twice more after six or seven days, each time choosing one of the most recently vaccinated children to provide the vaccine for the next group. So the last procedure occurred on the 11th of June, four days before arriving in Quebec, thereby creating a chain across the Atlantic in order to deliver fresh vaccine arm by arm. On the Fortitude, however, was one of the other ships which left at the same time with um, some of these Peter Robinson settlers. The surgeon chose a different method and performed all of his 29 vaccinations, both children and adults, in the first few days of the voyage. The surgeon of the Elizabeth, another ship, similarly reported that he too had vaccinated 14 children in Cork Harbour while waiting for a wind to sail on the 4th of May. All of these vaccines failed. So these different practices suggest that there was two very different aims for vaccination. The chain method I first described was designed to convey live matter for use in the colonies. On the other hand, vaccinating in bulk at the beginning of a voyage was designed to prevent an outbreak of smallpox during the voyage. 
And it's clear, however, that whatever method they were using, the Navy's vaccine supplies were in fact next to useless. One surgeon complained that the, Navy, that the vaccine provided by the Navy board had failed in every instance. It had probably been kept too long, he suggested, and was deposited between two sheets of plain glass and wrapped in a single sheet of paper, insufficient to keep it properly. Furthermore, the quantity was minute and it was difficult to see any of it on the glass. And I think it's interesting to note, actually, that the uniformity between the surgeon's descriptions of the failure actually suggests that they had quite a long discussion when they arrived in Quebec about vaccination and how they should complain about it. Another surgeon warned that the vaccine's loss of power could have had serious consequences, some of the children having smallpox and it being possible the families carried the infection with them. So at the same time as naval surgeons are experimenting with vaccine on emigrant ships to to Canada, their their colleagues were also experimenting with vaccinating convicts who sailed to Australia. Now if a voyage to Canada took a matter of weeks, the voyage to Australia took several months. So in 1826, for example, Surgeon Joseph Hughes boarded the convict ship Chapman in London, having received the usual package of establishment vaccine from the commissioners of the Navy, with instructions both to vaccinate the convicts and preserve the matter for use in the colonies during the voyage. So we hear then we have Surgeon Chapman is supposed to be combining both of these two different methods on one voyage. And he did it in a specific way. So when the captain of the Chapman anchored in the Cape Verde Islands off the west coast of Africa to replenish water stocks, Surgeon Hughes gave half of his original vaccine matter to the chief physician of St. Jago, one of the islands, a gift which was considered a great boon, they having none in the island. After the ship's departure and as the Chapman crossed the Atlantic, the surgeon attempted to what he called inoculate two soldiers' children with some of his remaining stock. The attempt failed and Hughes regretted that... that the matter that he'd left in St. Jago wouldn't have any effect either. The Chapman then put in at Rio de Janeiro on the coast of Brazil to refit. Now, in Cape Verde, Hughes had made a gift of half of his vaccine matter, but his discovery that the the matter was useless meant that he now had to apply to the principal English surgeon in Rio, a man called Dr. Dixon, to have the children on the Chapman vaccinated. Unfortunately, Hughes found, and uh, it's not clear from his language, but I think it's because the mothers were procrastinating and wouldn't let their children go. So Hughes found it impossible to get the children across the harbour to the hospital for the one hour on either Thursday or Sunday morning that the surgeons performed the procedure in Rio. Now, while he was in Rio, Hughes learnt from two other English surgeons that several surgeons of convict ships had complained of the same problem and that they supposed that damp or some other course had rendered the virus useless and inert. The surgeons in Rio also complained that they had found the matter that they obtained from British ships to be similarly inert. So the failure of Hughes' attempts to vaccinate, but his willingness to share his own precious supply and his shared professional frustrations in Rio show how quickly vaccine and matter have become an important medical commodity in islands and ports, mapping onto long-established maritime circuits of trade, people and supplies that link ports and islands in the empire, including London, Cork, Madeira, Cape Town, Rio de Janeiro, Calcutta and Sydney. Surgeons and physicians of different nationalities were sharing their little parcels of vaccine matter. And yet these networks of exchange were as frustrating and vulnerable as they were obviously vital. So from the mid-1820s, captains who sailed to Australia increasingly undertook their voyages non-stop depriving the naval surgeons of the, opportunity, of the kind of opportunities that we've just seen with Chapman to distribute, procure and replenish vaccine matter en route. And this changing nature of the Australian voyage also affected how surgeons attempted to vaccinate. So surgeons frequently complained about high numbers of children on Australian ships, whether it was convicts or emigrants. But in the context of vaccination, particularly during non-stop voyages, the children of emigrants, convicts, and also members of the military guard became invaluable, a point I think has a lot to say about what we might term an imperial economy of child migration in the 19th century as well. Nevertheless, I think, between the, it's important to note that between the 1820s and the 1840s, successes with vaccination remained the exception rather than the norm. <laughs> Surgeon journals are littered with complaints about bad lymph, matter that lost effectiveness, became inert, effete, or rendered useless by long keeping. Vaccinations routinely either totally failed or were unsuccessful in all cases, surgeons reported. So my recent research then has made it clear that emigrants, and particularly convicts, 
played a vital role in a period of what was widespread post-Napoleonic war medical experimentation by the Navy. They were experimenting with all kinds of different things for cleaning ships, um, with scurvy remedies. And vaccination was one aspect of this, as surgeons on convict ships tried to ascertain when and how vaccines should be used with most success. So some surgeons, as we've already seen, vaccinated immediately before the vessel left port. Others waited a few days for for seasickness to subside. Some waited a month, choosing to vaccinate in the warm air and steady sailing before the tropics. Others waited still longer, in the hope that the matter would be more likely to reach the colony in a useful state, once the carrier bodies of the emigrants and convicts were safely through the tropical heat. Surgeons struggled to balance then climatic assessment and environmental knowledge against the risk of smallpox during the voyage, and not least their desire to deliver lymph to the colony. So, for example, as the ship Albion approached 40 degrees latitude south of the equator in 1828, which is roughly the latitude of the Cape of Good Hope at the bottom of South Africa, Thomas Logan, the surgeon, finally used up his package of vaccine a full four months after leaving England. The day after the vaccinations, the weather in the Southern Ocean deteriorated. The ship's motion became violent, he explained, the air cold, and the convicts forced to remain crowded below. Logan began to regret his choice to vaccinate at that particular moment, and he explained that the bodies of the convicts on the Albion were in the most unfavourable circumstances to go through the disease. Ironically, it was, of course, just such conditions as these that surgeons often attributed the outbreaks of disease, including scurvy, typhus and smallpox in this period. By the next day, two days after vaccinating, Logan openly admitted that he had committed an error in delaying vaccination for so long but confessed that he had reserved the process of vaccination for a late period in the voyage because he wished to land a great supply of matter. I wished, in short, to do too much, he said, and I have therefore defeated my own object. Now, Logan's failure to vaccinate was so common that it wouldn't have diminished his professional reputation, but I think his kind of self-reflexive regret is quite starkly noticeable in relation to the, the surgeon journals in general, a complete absence of regret. On the other hand, I think, and what Logan's journal quite clearly shows is how much it mattered to him that success in vaccination would have brought him public recognition, gratitude, and perhaps even a colonial appointment in Sydney at this time. And colonial newspapers from the 1830s in particular provide abundant evidence of how highly prized vaccine matter was at this point. So when, in 1839, the troopship HMS Pelorus arrived in Sydney with a supply of this invaluable matter, the Sydney Morning Herald explained that no ships had arrived in the colony with lymph for two years, although various medical gentlemen had made repeated, though unsuccessful, attempts to deliver vaccine matter. By contrast, smallpox itself had arrived in 1828 and again in 1835 with the emigrant ship Canton. Moreover, by the late 1830s, nearly all of the convict ships arriving in Sydney and in Hobart at this time were arriving with scurvy, and emigrant ships were um, often identified as arriving with contagious fever, which um, part of the reason that they established formal quarantine Sydney facilities at Sydney in the 1830s. So the arrival of the Pelorus with vaccine matter, therefore, demanded recognition, and a deputation of subscribers explained in the Sydney Morning Herald that they presented the surgeon of the ship, Dr Riley, with a handsome silver snuff box engraved with the explanation that this was a token of regard for the benefit he has conferred by successfully introducing the vaccine lymph into New South Wales. So from the start, the prerogative to vaccinate early during a voyage in order to prevent outbreaks of smallpox at sea was in tension with colonial requirements and the professional status that this bore, that chains of bodies should keep a vaccine live until the end of a voyage. Well, this tension was complicated by surgeons' personal choices, colonial pretensions and climatic contingencies. It's clear that during the 1830s, these two competing priorities became aligned with the two streams of people going to Australia, convicts and emigrants from Britain and Ireland. So during the 1830s, the convict system is well established by this point and really reaching its peak at the end of the 1820s. But during the 1830s, the British government also began to send emigrants to the Australian colonies, to New South Wales and to South Australia. In 1838, surgeons of emigrant ships were instructed to examine the emigrants' arms or see their certificates that the operation had been performed before the voyage. In any case that seemed doubtful, before allowing the emigrants 
to embark, the surgeon was to review, renew the vaccination before departure. Emigrants also received instructions clearly stating that no family will be allowed to embark unless they furnish previously a certificate from a respectable medical practitioner that each of their children have either had the smallpox or been previously vaccinated. David Ross, the surgeon of the Parlin, for example, complained that despite his instructions, he had learnt that several of the children had not been vaccinated. On convict ships, however, vaccination appears to have served a different purpose, as we've seen. Rather than vaccinating convicts before departure, as they did with migrants, naval surgeons used convicts and their children as human t- chains to get live vaccine matter to the Australian colonies. The convict ship surgeon, in his written instructions, was instructed to keep up such a succession of vaccinated cases as may enable him to convey fresh virus to the colony if the number of convicts or passengers on board who may not have had the smallpox nor undergone vaccination and who shall consent to be vaccinated will admit of it. So the convict ship instructions clearly emphasise the importance of delivering vaccine to the colonies, but the wording also clearly states that the convicts must consent to the vaccination. This is a stark contrast to emigrants who had to submit to vaccination in order to gain admittance to the ship that would take them to Australia. Now, for their part, convicts often did their best to avoid vaccination. Convicts told surgeons that they had been vaccinated, only for it to subsequently become apparent that they had not. Even after the new instructions of 1840 removed the clause about consent, the surgeon William McDowell reported that, on inspection of the convicts to ascertain the number requiring requiring vaccination, I found that, according to their own declaration, they had all been previously vaccinated or had variola. In 1848, another surgeon reported that he could only vaccinate all the infants whose mothers would permit of it. So there's a couple of points of relevance here that I want to make. And the first one is um, surgeons routinely slipped between the language of inoculation and vaccination well into the 1830s. In 1818, for example, William McDowell, McDowell reported that he had inoculated with vaccine virus in both arms. The surgeon on the Granada also inoculated with vaccine virus. As late as 1836, one surgeon described inoculating 18 convicts. So for emigrants and convicts alike, let alone their surgeons then, it seems that the distinction between inoculation and the new vaccination procedure must often have been unclear, perhaps even seemed irrelevant, and the terminology confusing. It's likely that many people simply did not know if they'd undergone vaccination. Many others might well have undergone the procedure of vaccination, without it having been successful. So the question of whether or not they'd been vaccinated or not would be a reasonable question. And it's also possible that the majority of convicts had been vaccinated before their voyages, leaving a dearth of suitable convicts to ensure a supply of vaccine for the colony, something that surgeons often complained about. So from the first decade of the 19th century, charitable organisations and English parishes had organised vaccination campaigns, some of them compulsory, as in hunger food, from 1811. Compulsory vaccination also occurred in prisons in the early 19th century. During the 1820s, prison surgeons routinely reported that when cases of smallpox occurred, they vaccinated all the prisoners who had never had smallpox or who could not, who could not show a scar. From 1840, of course, free vaccination for all who wanted it came under the remit of the new poor law. So the frustration of surgeons, I think, about the lack of suitable bodies thus provides important evidence for us about the extent to which poor people were or were not vaccinated against smallpox, whether on land or at sea, in general during the first half of the 19th century. And I think it's also important in terms of uh, maritime health, because until now, historians of maritime health have tended to argue, using written accounts left by highly literate migrants, that emigrants came to share surgeons' belief about the importance of governmental regulation and stringent maritime sanitary measures, which in turn led to the containment of disease and reduced mortality at sea. Yet when we consider vaccination alongside practices of inspection, post-mortem dissection, which I think is a really important topic, and medical experimentation that routinely occurred on these ships far away from land, a very different picture emerges, one in which convicts and emigrants often responded to medical authority through resistance, concealment and mistrust, rather than acceptance. So early in the voyage of the example of the Elizabeth, for example, Surgeon Hughes knew that he did not have the respect or trust of the female convicts. He realised that even if the vast majority of the women had not already been vaccinated, he would never be able to induce them to go through the operation in any case. 
And I think there's a murky grey area here between consent and coercion, which is as pertinent to understanding 19th century medicine on land as it is on sea. And if, as Nadia Durbach has shown in her study of anti-vaccination um, campaigns, there was a sense among, amongst anti-vaccinators in 1869 that some British mothers were too poor to object, then the evidence from Australian voyages also suggests that this is a history that is much longer and, importantly, precedes the acts of the mid-19th century that made vaccination compulsory. So before concluding, I just want to make a quick remark on the question of provenance. Because throughout the 1820s and 1830s, as voyage after voyage failed to convey a vaccine to the Australian colonies, there seems to be little sense that convict limp generated any sense of distaste among colonists, of the kind of distaste that would come later as colonists routinely questioned the race and class of vaccine carriers. In 1844, the convict ship Tasmania stopped at Madeira. For the surgeon, Thomas Seaton, this rare stop offered a rare opportunity to both vaccinate the convicts and save his precious package of pure matter from home for the colony. He procured some unidentified vaccine matter in Madeira, and he doesn't say from whom, with which he vaccinated the convicts, four of the convicts. This exchange allowed him to keep his named package, the package from Dr Black, to deliver to the hospital at Hobart Town. Now, Seton clearly believed that the packet from England was worth considerably more than the lymph that had travelled through the bodies of convicts. For them, the Madeiran lymph was perfectly sufficient. So in Seton's actions, I think, in 1844, we find emerging this question of provenance, an idea that would become crucial to imperial vaccination debates later in the century. So to conclude then, travelling with vaccine lymph brought naval surgeons into a prestigious global network of medical exchange, but it was nevertheless an a network that often failed. Far from being a story of professional triumph, however, any attempt to trace naval surgeons' efforts to supply live vaccine lymph to the Australian colonies in the mid-19th century reveals a continuing story of messy failure. Precisely because voyages of several months were a deeply unreliable method of conveying lymph matter to the Australian colonies, vaccination became a matter of intense professional pride and thwarted ambition, as surgeons became important men in colonies, increasingly obsessed by the arrival of disease. In addition, voyages provided a space to experiment, not just with vaccination, but with medical remedies and anatomical examinations after death. Now, I think these practices raise important questions about compulsion, consent, trust, particularly when, as we have seen, the surgeon's instructions clearly advocate treating convicts and emigrants differently. But I think it's also an important topic to consider in relation to the history of smallpox in Australia, because recently the question of whether European colonisers unwittingly or deliberately in introduced the disease has played a significant part in debates about the violent dispossession of Aboriginal people in Australian history. Now, we know that smallpox devastated the Aboriginal population of Australia in the early years of colonisation, particularly in the years 1789 to 91, and again between 1829 and 1831. Now, some historians have distanced European colonisers from culpability in the effects of smallpox on the Aboriginal people of Australia by arguing that it was clinically unlikely. Such arguments about likelihood, however, I think, rely on the traditional notion of Australia's distance, a notion that is unsustainable when we actually look at the actual practices that occurred. Now, in their journal, surgeons constantly complained that vaccine matter was ineffective, but rather than trying to use this to support this claim that European colonisers probably didn't introduce smallpox, I think what it does is it actually does the opposite. Because paradoxically, as they made more and more desperate attempts to make vaccines travel, complex networks of exchange and experimentation emerge, and the maritime spaces between Britain and its colonies become filled with a myriad of less and less knowable connections. So precisely because vaccination was so ineffectual, I would like to argue, and not a question of smoothly disseminating vaccine matter, what they created was this big old global mess that seems to render the idea of voyages as vectors obsolete, by taking voyages and the connections that they made, therefore, much more seriously than we have done in the past, I think it becomes impossible to disentangle or make claims for clinically unlikely links between global histories of Australian and European smallpox and vaccination. Thank you. <laughs>